Okay, last week we talked about how Jesus was the unexpected Messiah. We spent most of our time talking about how Jesus did things and how that was different than what uh, people expected him to do. We talked about how the Jewish people at the time when Jesus was alive had expectations for their Messiah that were really um, more in line with the life of Moses. And Moses was all about rescuing his people out of slavery. So that was one image that they had in their head also because during the time of the life of Jesus, the people, the Jewish people were living under Roman occupation. So they saw themselves as sort of repeating um, the, the time that Moses lived in, which was a time when they were under the rule of someone else. So that was one idea that they had. The second idea that they had for a Messiah was of a king, sort of like King David, who was a military leader who fought for their freedom and then uh, ushered in a time of prosperity, uh, peace, and wealth for the people of Israel. So when the people encountered Jesus for the first time, those were the images that they had in their heads. That's what they expected their Messiah to be. And Jesus consistently did not meet those expectations. He did different things that caught them off guard and caught them by surprise. So this morning, we're going to talk about if Jesus was not that kind of Messiah, then it begs the question, what sort of Messiah was he? So that's what we're going to look at. Okay, we're going to start with Mark 5:42, and this is going to be tucked into the story that we're telling, but this is sort of the conclusion. It says, at this, they were completely astonished. And what I want us to see here is that Jesus is astonishing. Even at the time when he was alive and he was um, doing things and teaching things, that people constantly had this reaction to him of surprise and astonishment. They weren't anticipating him to be able to say and do the things that he said and did. So what made Jesus astonishing? There are a few things that we're going to talk about, but first of all, he noticed outsiders. He took the time to notice outcasts, and that's one of the things that we see Jesus do that's astonishing. He doesn't care about wealth or power. So if you think about someone who is gearing up to be a leader um, during this time period, Jesus didn't pay attention to wealth or power. He wasn't influenced by those things. He didn't care about those things, which was astonishing to the people. Um, instead, he slowed down and stopped and paid attention to people that no one else paid attention to. Um, he looked for those opportunities. He listened to people and heard their whole story. And this was astonishing. And he seemed to have total authority over nature, disease, and even death. And so remember we talked about how Mark's gospel, Mark loves to put us right into the middle of the action of the story, and he's more interested in what Jesus does and says. Um, and so he's constantly showing Jesus doing things that are surprise, and they're surprising because they show his authority over nature, disease, and death in a way that no one else has ever shown before. And so the question on everybody's mind as we're going through the gospel of Mark is, who is Jesus? Who is this? guy? Is he the Messiah? And if he is, what sort of Messiah is he? So let's talk a little bit about what Jesus did. So you all have been reading through uh, the Gospel of Mark, and I, I'm just recapping here some of the things that you read this week. So this week we saw Jesus calm a storm with his words. We saw him cast demons out of a man and into a pig. Uh, we saw him heal a bleeding woman, and we saw him bring a, girl, a dead girl back to life. So those are a few of the things that he did. We also saw him offend the people in his hometown. When he began teaching, they were offended because they thought they knew him. They had their own ideas of who Jesus was supposed to be, and he astonished them, <clears throat> and they weren't comfortable with that. Um, he sent his disciples on a mission trip. And he also fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. So those are a few of the things. That's just in two chapters of the Gospel of Mark. So if that gives you any idea, Mark moves quick, and he is bringing out you know, all of the, the biggest stories, and he's moving us through them. So remember, we're going to be looking at the question, what kind of a Messiah is Jesus? And I want you, as we're talking through this, to remember we talked about that Jesus came to show us what God is like. That's his mission. So while he's here on earth, he's showing us something about the heart of God. So as we talk through these things, I want you to be asking yourself, what do I see about God and God's heart for the world when I hear these stories about Jesus? So what kind of a Messiah is Jesus? 
he noticed people on the fringes of society, the people that everybody else thought were unimportant. Those were the people that Jesus paid attention to. He didn't care about wealth or worldly power. He looked for people who were honest about their need for healing and who had faith. So that's what he's on the lookout for. And he seemed to have total authority over nature, disease, and even death. So these are the kinds of things that we're seeing um, about who Jesus is in these first few chapters of Mark. So now we're going to look at a story that shows two different people who approached Jesus with their expectations of healing. And I want you to be listening for ways that they're similar and ways that they're different. So the two people are Jairus, who comes to Jesus on behalf of his daughter, and then a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years who comes to Jesus. And this story I was reading this week um, is an example of something that Mark likes to do in, in his gospel, which is called a Markan sandwich, which sounds really tasty, but actually it's something that he does when he's writing. So he'll introduce a story, then he'll pause it, and he'll introduce a whole nother story, and then he'll come back to the first story to finish it off, but both of those stories are connected. They call it like a toothpick. So there's an idea that runs through both of those stories that connects them. So that's the Markin sandwich. So listen for that, it's just kind of fun. Okay, then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. So right off the bat, one of the things I want us to see about this story is that Jairus is a synagogue leader. So he's a Jewish leader in his community. And he would have been somebody sort of important in his community. And he comes to Jesus with a very important need. His daughter is dying. And I think we kind of read the story um, and maybe don't notice the desperation that's in his voice when he comes to Jesus. He's desperate for his daughter and he's asking Jesus to stop what he's doing and to come and put his hands on her so she will be healed and live. So the other thing that we see is that Jairus believes that Jesus has the power and the authority to do something here that would actually save his daughter. So his expectation is that Jesus can actually do something to prevent his daughter from dying. Okay. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So this is the middle part where Mark introduces a new story, and this is about a woman and what we know about her. It's not a lot, but we know there's a huge crowd following Jesus, and remember, that's very characteristic of Jesus in the Gospels. He's constantly surrounded by a crowd of people who want to learn from him and to watch him and to see what he's going to do. So we have a large crowd, and there's a woman in the crowd who's been bleeding for 12 years, and we know that she's suffered a great deal, and she has spent everything she has, but instead of getting better she's growing worse so a few things about this this woman would have been considered an outsider in her community because of the fact that she was bleeding it created a problem where she was considered ceremonially unclean which meant she couldn't participate in community life she was supposed to keep herself removed and separate from their community because she was considered unclean so what I want us to see here is that for 12 years She's been living on the fringes of her community. And I want you to think about the emotional toll that would take on a person. That not only is she suffering this physical ailment, but she's also suffering this spiritual and emotional ailment because she's ostracized from the people that she loves and from the people that um, should be caring for her. So she's considered unclean and, and what that would sort of do to you. Okay, so this woman is in the crowd, and she comes up to Jesus. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So what I want you to see, and if you can picture this scene in your head, there's Jesus, and he's going somewhere important. He's on a mission um, to... to heal this little girl who's dying, which is a very immediate, urgent need, right? So he's on his way. And in this crowd of people, this woman sort of sneaks up behind him and touches um, the end of his cloak. So she doesn't want to be noticed. She's trying to blend in with this crowd, but she believes that Jesus has the power to do something about her need. 
Um, she believes that if she touches his clothes, that she would be healed. So I want us to see there's an element of faith here that she's reaching out to Jesus. She sees Jesus as a solution to her need. And immediately, remember Mark loves those action words. So he says, immediately her bleeding stopped and she knew that she was freed from her suffering. So she knows she's been successful about all of this. Um, But let's see what happens. It says, At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? So again, Mark places us right in the action. At once, Jesus knew because he's Jesus. He knows something's happened and he stops everything. And the way I picture this, it's like a parade, right? Jesus is going somewhere very important with someone very important to do very important things. And he's got a crowd of people who are dying to see what's going to happen. And in the middle of that, Jesus shuts it all down. And he just stops and he asks this question, who touched my clothes? And the disciples' reaction is pretty natural, like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Everybody's touching you. You're in a crowd. That's going to happen. But Jesus is determined to find this woman. Okay, let's see what happens. It says, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Okay, I love this vision that Jesus keeps looking for her. And the language here is he is determined to find her. She's kind of trying to sneak up in the crowd and do this thing very subtle and without being noticed. But Jesus stops the whole scene and he's saying, I need to find this woman and recognize her publicly. Um, And I want you to see that she's honest. She comes forward, and I love this phrase, that she tells him the whole truth. And I just imagine she's telling him the whole story right then and there in front of everybody. She's telling him about the 12 years of suffering, what that's done to her emotionally, how she spent everything she had in an effort to get healed. Um, So she tells him the whole story, and he says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So Jesus is recognizing that she had faith and that her faith led to some sort of action. In both of these stories, we see Jairus believes that Jesus can help his daughter, so he goes to find Jesus. And in the same way, she believes that if she just touches the end of his cloak, that Jesus can heal her. And so she takes action. And so I want you to see that connection between belief and action. Okay, and also I want us to see that Jesus has not only healed her physical ailment, he's also restored her into her community. The fact that he stops everything and calls her out and in front of her entire community explains that she's been healed is an opportunity to restore her back into her community because he's saying she's no longer unclean. She is a permanent member of your society welcome her back and that's part of Jesus's heart right which shows us God's heart it's not only that she has physical healing but that she's also restored and it is a form of complete healing okay while Jesus was still speaking some people came from the house of Jairus the synagogue leader your daughter is dead they said why bother the teacher anymore Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. So while all of this is going on with this woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years, remember that Jairus' daughter is dying. She's in the process of dying, and they were on this emergency errand, and, and Jesus has just stopped and paused. And I imagine Jairus is kind of standing there like, okay, let's, yeah, let's finish this up and then let's go because we have an emergency. Um, but his, some people come from his house and say, it's too late. It's done. There's nothing he can do for you now. And then I want us to see that Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. And I think when we read this story, it's important for us to put ourselves in Jairus' position here. Um, If you've just been told that your daughter is dead and someone says to you, don't be afraid, just believe, that's an incredibly cruel thing to say to someone if you're not able to do something about it. Um... Jesus is telling him to have faith. Faith in what, right? His daughter has just died, and he's just been told that. So 
I just picture Jairus being very conflicted and very unsure of, of what to believe or what to hope in this moment. So let's see what happens. Okay. He, Jesus did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. So Jesus goes in, and they are already in mourning, and he says they don't need to mourn because the child is only asleep. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. So Jesus is limiting the audience who are going to witness this event. He pairs it down, so it's just this three disciples the parents of the child, and himself. And they go in this room with this little girl who's lying there dead. And Jesus takes her by the hand and speaks to her. And with her words and with with his words and with his actions, he brings her back to life. Um, So what I want us to see is this is complete healing, but this is power over death. That what Jesus is showing us here is that he has the authority and the power to bring the dead back to life. So this is unexpected. This is not something anyone can do. This is something only God can do. And Jesus is the one there who is doing it. Okay, and Mark 5, continuing on, it says, Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. So we end where we began with this idea of these people being completely astonished. Jesus is not what they expected. They have expectations for their Messiah, and Jesus is so different from that. Um, But at the same time, they're completely overwhelmed by what he can do. And um, they're seeing him have authority over death. And that's not what they anticipated, but they're amazed by it. And remember, I talked, I think it was last week, about this idea of Jesus being... um, not able to keep himself from fixing what is broken. That Jesus has this habit of rushing in and trying to repair and restore broken things. So that's what we're seeing in both of these stories. That's how they're kind of connected. But I want us to take a minute and contrast um, how Jesus healed because he he handled these situations in different ways. So with Jairus' daughter, when he healed her, he took her by the hand and healed her with his words. And when he healed the bleeding woman, he did it because she reached out and touched his cloak. And I want us to see that in both of these occasions, there's an element of faith, right? Jairus went to Jesus because he believed that Jesus could do something for his daughter. And I also want us to see that the bleeding woman reached out and touched his cloak because she had faith that Jesus could heal her. So in both of these occasions, they're coming to Jesus with expectation, Um, Also, I want us to see that when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, he limited the audience. There were only a few people in the room. And when he healed the woman, it was in public, surrounded by this huge crowd of people. And also, when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, he waited where he was. He was not in a hurry. He did not have the same sense of urgency that Jairus did because Jesus was in total control over the situation. So he waited where he was, and she died in the meantime. Um, But with the woman, he stopped, and he listened to her whole story. So what I want us to see here is Jesus is never in a hurry. He has this sense of God's timing and God's purposes that may not be the same as everybody else's in the crowd. Um, But he knows when God is going to do the healing. And so he's not in a rush. He has a sense of peace about that. And then finally, I want us to see that the healing was complete. That for Jairus' daughter, he raised her from the dead. And for this woman who had been bleeding, not only did he fix her uh, physical ailment, but he also restored her socially and emotionally and spiritually. So there's a wholeness um, that's available to her. And in both of these cases, it's more than what they expected. Uh, They had expectations for healing, but Jesus goes above and beyond even what they're capable of imagining him to be able to do. Okay, so Jesus is a different kind of Messiah, and this is really what we were uh, going to talk about this morning. Jesus came to serve, 
Remember, their idea is a, a Messiah who is a liberator or a Messiah who's a king and a warrior. But instead of that, Jesus is focused on service. He's not rich and powerful, and he's not influenced by wealth and power. Um, he didn't come to make his followers rich and powerful. We'll see that in a few weeks where the disciples get a little confused about that. They're kind of angling for position, and Jesus isn't interested in that. Um, but instead, he's paying attention to people, and he's paying attention to people that no one else pays attention to. He's looking for people who are on the edge, and those are the people that he cares about. And also that he had total authority over pain, evil, and death. Remember we talked about in the Gospel of Mark that Mark uses these miracles as a sign to point to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. And he uses these things to indicate the coming kingdom of God. So when, as we see Jesus doing things that only God can do, it's a symbol or a signal of what God is in the process of doing, which is a bigger, a bigger plan and a greater healing. Okay, so Jesus was a different kind of Messiah than they expected, but he brought complete healing, and he brings healing for our greatest need. Remember when we read the story about the paralytic that was lowered through the roof, and Jesus began by forgiving his sin, and then he healed his legs, and we talked about how Jesus is always interested in healing us of our greatest need, which is our need to be restored into relationship with him, and our need for forgiveness, and we talked about repentance and belief, that that's what Jesus wants from us, and repentance is agreeing with God, being honest with God about our broken brokenness and our need and our belief is that is just the tiniest hint of faith and belief that God has the ability to do what we can't and to do what we need most so that's what Jesus is looking for and here we in these two stories we see that Jesus heals in response to faith so I want you all as we close to think about what it means that Jesus is this kind of Messiah. He's unexpected. He does unexpected things, but this is who he is and it's different than what we expect. But I want us to think about why that matters. Why does it matter that Jesus is this sort of Messiah? And I want you to think about what that might mean for you. If Jesus has come to bring complete healing, I want you to ask yourself the question, what is my greatest need? What do I need healing from? And it might, you might, like the woman who was bleeding for 12 years, you might think, well, it's to be healed from, you know, my physical ailment. Um, but Jesus wants to do so much more. He wants to bring complete healing that's also spiritual and emotional and relational. He wants to restore us back to his original purpose for us, which was to be in close relationship with him. I'm going to close in prayer and then you can go to your groups and talk about the reading from this week and I hope that will be helpful to you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the reminder that um, you want to fix what is broken in our lives and that you care about our greatest needs and that you are a different kind of Messiah and you're so much more than we expect. I pray that you would um, help us to identify in our hearts our greatest need and that we would begin to understand that we need faith to trust in your ability to heal us. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you.